natural monument is an enduring masterpiece of art on a grand scale. It's viewed on a daily basis by a captive mass audience, which is the general public. But most importantly, this work of art must function as a habitable structure for its occupants, not only for the short term, but for a design life well in excess of 50 years, typically. Some of the greatest achievements in architecture have been those that have embraced this concept of occupancy comfort in their designs. Welcome to this short series of videos prepared by University of Queensland and presented by G. James Glass and Aluminium discussing the basics of facade design. I'll introduce you to our host. This is my colleague, Gary Aspen. He is G. James Technical and Marketing Manager in our glass department. You may not recognise him in the lecture because he's going to be CGI'd in as Brad Pitt because his mug's so ugly. And I'm Jim Stringfellow. I'm a facade engineer with our commercial contracting division. And who are you going to be, Jim? <laughs> I think anybody would be better looking than myself. <laughs> so what do specialist facade contractors do? We help transform architects' visions into reality. The journey from a concept to the final inhabited building is quite an involved, intense, and sometimes almost religious experience for architects. The challenges and the extent of work that's required can be quite daunting. The architect's involvement with the facade contractor in establishing a relationship, trust and working together is the secret to that success. If there's anything that you gain from this slide that explains that whole concept from journey to reality, is that the design development process, once it starts, the architect has to relinquish some of his control and start to trust and work with the facade contractor. That's very important. But uh, to achieve the ultimate outcome, compromise is always needed. A good facade designer is able to assess solutions to meet the optimum balance, not only of appearance, but also of structural adequacy, safety, budget, comfort, and durability. Design flexibility and intelligent architectural decisions can maintain the visual intent of the building and work within these constraints. Practicalities of performance cannot be underestimated. Very true. If there's a problem that we foresee the most in our industry, it's water leaks in buildings. Now the building not only has to prevent the passage of heat, rain, air, light and sound into the building, we also have to look at the safety aspects. Wind loads, self-weight of the facade and other imposed loads applied to the facade are quite critical in the design consideration. Some of the uh, other practicalities you need to consider are um, material longevity, the manufacturing efficiencies, yes. quality control, transport requirements or limitations, and also installation practicalities. Above all though, probably the greatest thing to keep in mind as the architect is that budget is a huge constraint for buildings. Every job we face. So. Absolutely. And you'll be surprised, and you should see when you're walking through the city, notice how many gravestones there are lying around the buildings that have been abandoned partway through construction because the clients haven't had the budget. You're right, Jim. Compromise is often the only way to achieve a cost-effective outcome for projects. An example of this is the Riverside Centre and Roperi Plaza buildings in the, in the slide. These build, both these buildings were designed by Harry Seidler. The ground floor of Riverside Centre has, which was built approximately 30 years ago, has seven to nine metre high glass in one single peak. That Very large. The biggest glass available in the world at the time, wasn't at it? At the time it was. And even today, it's still not very cost effective. Yeah, that's true. When, uh, when Riverside Plaza was built, they wanted to achieve that same look, that all glass, big glass look to the ground floors. But the budget didn't allow it. So what the, the solution was, was to come up with using smaller panels, stacking the glass one on top of each other with very small silicon butt joints. From a distance you don't even see these and it looks the same. I can hardly even see the horizontal joints. The other advantage of, of the smaller panels is if a, a breakage occurs, they can easily be replaced and it's very cost effective. 
Stores like the, the Apple Store, which used massive glass, the Apple Store in Sydney, which used massive glass, have had two failures during this fire. That's very really expensive. <laughs> very expensive. The cost of these has been over half a million dollars each to replace. It involves chartering special planes, special equipment. Is that a quarter of a million dollars each? Half a million dollars each. Wow. Other things that need to be considered in design is where we are in the world. Like in Brisbane, our climate is very subtropical. If you're building a building in Melbourne, it's very temperate. The conditions are different. You need to consider that. The occupants of the building, is it a university? Is it a commercial building? Is it a hospital? It needs to be taken into account. The size of the windows, can you actually physically get them to the, into the openings? Can they be, they can be too big. Um, how the glass looks internally. On this slide, I'm showing Eve Apartments. It's used for reflective glass. It looks great during the day. It's reflective on the outside, but at night it works in reverse, and you can't see out of the building. The tenants, this is very objectionable to the tenants. They live right on Albert Park, paying for that view, don't they? Yes, have a beautiful view and can't, and can't see it. At night time. At night time, yes. Um, how the glass to replace if it's damaged, I've already touched on. The amount of visible light is very important, and I think it is not assessed well by architects in this country. There is a trend, an architectural trend, driven by design ideas out of Europe and North America to use high transmission glass, which results in glare issues. Here is two buildings in Sydney. Number one, Bly Street, which is a very European, it's a European design building. Uh, with very high light transmission, and 126 Phillips Street, the Deutsche Bank building. The Bly Street building is, there's a very similar building in Essen, in Germany, isn't there? There is, yes. This has 60% light transmission, this glass. Wow. Very high. Compared to the Deutsche Bank building, at almost half that. Both, both uh, projects have very large windows, and you can see, as you can see from the internal shots, you can see out of them very clearly. So you can sacrifice the visible light and still achieve your objective. Good views. Absolutely, I'll agree with you there. Our boss has a 1% VLT glass in your bathroom at home, doesn't it? Yes, he does. And you can still, you still see out as clear as day. I've been there and I've seen through it and you can hardly tell if it's even tinted during the daylight hours. Very true. The other design consideration is consider the option, the occupants of the building. This building is the Feast building at South Bank. It has very high transmission glass, and they have beautiful views over the South, uh, the South Bank. Unfortunately, they can't see those views because their blinds are always down, because the visible light transmission through the glass is so high. It's exactly right. Our office here had the blinds are drawn all day, every day. It's just too yeah. scary without them, isn't it? But the, our glass is much lower than theirs, and it's still glary. Yeah. What's our glass? About 23%. Uh, it's less than 20%. Over 18%, something. Yeah. This is a, a map of the world, and what we've done is cut the globe at, at the equator and superimposed Australia over the northern hemisphere. Yeah, that's amazing to see where Australia lies in comparison to the northern hemisphere. Tasmania, which is our coldest part of the country, is in line with Spain, which is considered really hot in Europe. Well, that's where they go for their, uh, their summer holidays, to the beach. So that sort of shows the difference. We're a lot closer to the equator. We have a lot more natural uh, blue sky, a lot more sunlight. We don't have the conditions of Europe and North America. So our design should not be mimicking that. Absolutely. Head Street Buildings in Brisbane. The Harris Side is on uh, Rotherian Plaza and Riverside Centre. And in the middle of that is the more recently built Triple One Eagle Street. Very contrasting design. The Triple One Eagle Street building has very high light transmission and about 48%, where the two Harry Seidler buildings are almost half that. And those Harry Seidler buildings have sun shading devices over them too. Yes, as well, yes. What building do you, would you like to be attended on, do you think, Tim? I don't know. The uh, 111 Eagle looks very impressive with floor to ceiling glass, doesn't it? I imagine they're going to have some glare issues in there. I think I'd be more comfortable working in the uh, Rotherian or side centre buildings. Yes. We'll discuss this more at our, during the lecture. Very interesting topic. Thank you. In our next lecture, we'll discuss glass.